Support for Modern Love comes from Living Proof. Living Proof knows you have more important things to do than styling your hair. Get styles that last two times longer when you use their Prime Style Extender. Use the code PRIME at livingproof.com for a free travel size Prime Style Extender with your $20 order. We are the science. You are the living proof. And by audible.com, now offering listeners a free 30-day trial membership. Choose from more than 180,000 titles, including audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more. Go to audible.com slash modern. That's slash modern. And get started today. From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. You can choose your significant other, but you can't choose your in-laws. When free spirit Artis Henderson first met her future mother-in-law, a conservative Christian, they didn't exactly hit it off. But she never could have imagined the event that would bring them together. Actor Constance Wu of the ABC hit series Fresh Off the Boat reads Artis's essay, Marry a Man Who Loves His Mother. When Miles and I decided to live together, I asked him if his mother, Terry, would be upset. We sat at the kitchen table in his apartment near Fort Rucker, Alabama, while the warm fall evening pressed against the sliding glass doors. Miles would graduate from flight school in a few months, and the Army would be sending him to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. My job in Tallahassee would be ending at the same time, and the move felt right to both of us. Don't worry about it, he said. He leaned back in his wooden chair and propped a foot against the leg of the table. She'll probably want to send us a housewarming gift. Go ahead and think of something. I thought placemats would be nice. Terry came for a visit three weeks after we moved into our tiny rented house on the outskirts of Fort Bragg. She did not bring placemats. She was tense and unsettled, the way I remembered her. And she refused to stay in our guest bedroom. She stayed in a hotel across town instead. In our home, Terry was cordial. She cooked dinner, churning out Miles' favorites, like burnt steak stew, meals with a history that reached back to their hometown in Texas. She made the sugar cookies that Miles liked, the kind I could never get right. And she talked about home and church and family. On the second day, after Miles had put on his uniform and left for the base, Terry suggested that we drive to the mall in Raleigh. Spring unfolds slowly in North Carolina, and the air was cool and damp, even as the first daffodils pushed through the wet earth. We climbed into her rental car and drove through Fayetteville, where rhododendrons bloomed pink against the gray morning. The rain started when we reached the interstate, and Terry launched into the reason for her visit. You know, Brad and I don't approve of you living together, she said, referring to Miles' father. She called it living in sin. Her hands gripped the steering wheel, and outside it poured and poured. When he has sex with you, he's disrespecting you. I thought about telling her that he sometimes disrespected me on the couch. Once in the kitchen. She talked for an hour and a half, without pause, without my input... But when we reached the shopping center, the space between us seemed somehow easier. We spent the afternoon shopping, as good friends often will, inspecting sales racks and eating Chinese in the food court. At the makeup counter at Macy's, Terry tried on lavender eyeshadow. 
That looks nice on you, I said. She smiled shyly into the hand mirror. When the saleswoman asked if she'd like her to wrap it up, Terry nodded. She was strangely tentative about the exchange, as if she weren't used to buying nice things for herself. Later, after the visit, I asked if Brad had liked the new eyeshadow. He didn't notice, she said coolly. The distance had returned. In the summer, we stopped at Miles' home in the Texas Panhandle on our way to Fort Hood in the central part of the state. His unit would spend nine months training there before heading to Iraq. As we turned off the highway onto their gravel road, a steady wind blew. It stirred the dry grass and ruffled the cows in the pasture. Miles spent his days outside under the big Texas sky. He rode horses and worked the ranch with Brad while I stayed inside with Terry. She showed me how to make her meatloaf and wrote the recipe for her sugar cookies on an index card for me to take to Fort Hood. She talked endlessly, hardly pausing for breath. It was as if she weren't used to having an audience and needed to unload the things she carried in her heart. She talked about Miles, about how long it took to conceive him, about the miscarriages that came after. She numbered her lost babies among her children. She talked about breastfeeding, sleepless nights, and Miles' sweet baby smile. She cornered me once about the move to Texas, but before she could get into the sinful parts, someone interrupted the conversation. Anyway, Miles and I were married in less than a year, and by then the point was moot. At Christmas, we were back in the panhandle. The Henderson clan had assembled for the holidays, and they were a hard-drinking, hard-partying lot. They gathered at Uncle Rick's Canyon House, where the cousins played cards and drank Coors Light while Aunt Minnie chain-smoked on the back porch. Terry greeted them each with a stiff hug. She fit oddly into this mix. She was raised a Catholic, and her mother still went to Mass every Sunday. But when she married Brad, a conservative Protestant, she set aside her faith and adopted his. While Brad's family were church-going folk, none of them approached religion with his hard-line zeal. So while the drinking and cussing and sinning carried on around her, Terry kept herself apart. At one point in the card game, someone asked Miles where his mother had gone. He hooked a thumb over his shoulder toward the back room where the kids watched cartoons. The cousins rolled their eyes and snickered. Miles was the only one not to laugh. On the day Miles was deployed, after we left him at the hangar on the base, Terry came back to our apartment. She helped me pack up our life so I could go home to my family in Florida. Together, we boxed the towels and the bed linens, the crock pot, and the TV. We loaded them into Miles' pickup and Terry drove the truck back to Texas, where it would wait for him to come home. When he did come home, it was not the way we expected, but with an escort and an honor guard and casualty assistance officers. Terry told me that when the notifying soldier came to her door, She wouldn't let him speak. Stop, she said, and held up a hand. Just tell me if my son is alive. No, ma'am, the soldier said. He's not. I couldn't imagine that kind of backbone. I had listened silently through my own notification, then thanked the soldiers as they left. But later, when it had all sunk in, this new reality and the things we do when we lose someone we love, 
Her reaction felt right. Miles was the best of her. He had her face, her build, her Texas twang. As much as he was to me, he was more to her, more viscerally hers. They shared DNA, for God's sake. After the first few months, after the unspeakable sadness of the funeral and learning the horrible details of Miles' death, Terry came to Florida to help me sort through the things sent back from Iraq. There were two black plastic bins filled with Miles' possessions, carefully labeled and organized, still covered with a fine dusting of Iraqi sand. Although they were legally mine, I was next of kin, after all, it didn't feel right that I should have sole access to them. We sat in my garage with the doors open while heavy sheets of rain poured down outside and sifted through Miles' life in the desert. We sorted through his notebooks and office supplies, his rolled socks and army fatigues. We flipped through his CD collection and we paged through his books. When it was all too much, too much to remember, too much life packed into those plastic containers, Terry stopped and she pulled a t-shirt from the pile. She raised it to her face and breathed deeply, searching for some trace of miles. She did not know what I knew, for I had already done the same. The army had laundered his clothes before sending them home, and this too was lost. What remained was the space created by Miles's absence, thick and palpable with our grief. Losing a spouse is in no way like losing a child, but all loss is in some way like losing ourselves. In the months after Miles' death, Terry and I struggled to reorient our own lives, and in that search, we found each other. We began to bridge the distance that had been between us, bringing our shared love for Miles into the unknowable middle ground. At the military briefing following his death, we saw photos of the citrus orchard where his helicopter crashed, and we read the final seconds of audio from the in-flight voice recorder. Pull up, Miles had said at the very end. Terry stood behind me during the hardest parts, pressing her small hands into my shoulders. I have heard people say that you should never marry a man who does not love his mother. I was lucky. Miles loved his mother fiercely. He loved me too. In losing him, Terry and I have not divvied up his love as we have his other things. We have discovered that there is more than enough to share. Constance Wu, reading Artis Henderson's essay, Marry a Man Who Loves His Mother. We'll check in with Artis after the break. Living Proof products make life easier. Just ask Erin, who works at ModCloth in L.A. I work in fashion, so my hair is an important part of my outfit completion. And my go-to product that I use every single time I wash my hair is the Prime Style Extender. I love that. I love the way it smells. I love what it does for my hair. I feel like it just, like, polishes it up and makes it last longer without washing. 
Use the code PRIME at livingproof.com for a free travel size Prime style extender with your $20 order. I'm Steve Allman. I'm Cheryl Strayed. And we're the co hosts of Dear Sugar Radio, a podcast from WBUR for the lost, lonely, and heartsick. We take your questions, no matter how deep and dark, and offer radically empathic advice. Subscribe to Dear Sugar Radio on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. We're back. It's Modern Love, the podcast. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. You just heard that beautiful essay written by Artis Henderson. Artis still lives in her native Florida. We checked in with her and began by asking her exactly how she met Miles. So Miles and I met in a nightclub in Tallahassee, which is maybe the trashiest way to meet the love of your life. It was called the Late Night Library, which is a pretty good name for a nightclub, I think. Um, but we always swore that we would tell people we met through mutual friends, which is what we did for a long time. It took Artis a while to adjust to military life. Things got better when she went from being Miles' girlfriend to being his wife. But with the new deeper partnership came more responsibility. Miles and I were linked, so the things I did could reflect on him. Like if a military wife gets pulled over on base... And it gets back, you know, it gets back to her husband, it gets back to his commander, then he gets in trouble. So you have to be careful. You have to be respectful. I saw also sort of how rank matters, sort of the way that, you know, if a wife's husband outranks my husband, then that wife outranks me. As Miles was moved around the country, Artis followed, getting new jobs and making friends wherever she went but eventually getting uprooted again and again exhausted artists, and she realized her only constants were the men, women, and children in Miles's unit. These families moved together across the country, forging strong connections. But when Miles was deployed, instead of staying on base with the other families in the unit, artists decided to move back to Florida to live with her mom a decision that wasn't received well by other military families. But I saw later why, because I was so far from the military when he died, and I think that would have been a different, and I don't know if it would have been better, but it definitely would have been a more understanding source of support. After he died, I mean, I heard from a lot of the military wives I had known some I didn't even know well. Um, I remember this one woman sent me a gift card to Applebee's, and I was so touched. She, it was a woman I had met once. She put a note in the card saying, you know, if I lived closer, she would have brought me, you know, a covered dish or casseroles or the sort of food you bring when someone's grieving. But because I was so far, it was the best she could do. And what about Miles's mother, Terry? We asked artists if they're still in touch. Terry and I are still connected in a way that... I mean, I'm still just daily surprised at her, her generosity, and the way she cares for everyone, I think, but certainly the way she cares for me. I'm seeing someone now pretty seriously... And it's been a very long time. I guess I should say it's been a long time since I've been in a really serious relationship. And so I posted a picture on Facebook. And you know, once it's Facebook official, it's really official. So um, I posted a picture of the two of us together. Terry immediately sent me an email or a Facebook message and asked who he was and what's he like. And I think she was genuinely happy for me. After publishing this piece, artists decided to write a memoir about the experience in more detail, including an eerily similar tragedy that she experienced much earlier in her life. So, and they always say life is funny. Um, So my dad died when I was five in a plane crash. So I wrote in the memoir just about 
the way his death and Miles' death sort of overlapped or they had such a similar feeling and that life is so strange that way. Her father was a licensed commercial pilot, but he was flying his private plane when he crashed, and Artis was on board. We went out for our usual flight, and it was just the two of us. And um, there was a problem with the plane. You know, I, I must have known something. That's, that's one of the only things I remember. I remember asking him if we were going to crash. And he said, no, baby, sit back down. And he almost brought it in, I think. But at the last minute, the tail caught on some trees. And so we went sort of nose first into the ground. And he died instantly, I think. And then um, my spine was crushed, my lower spine. But, but they fixed me. <laughs> And I can walk. The similarities between how Miles and her father died are just too strong. Sometimes it feels like more than artists can handle. But there have been moments of steadying grace that have helped her find her way. Months after Miles died, Artis was going through his belongings. She found an unopened letter that was addressed to her. Miles had written it just in case he didn't come back from Iraq. Here's a short excerpt. My dearest artists, you are the love of my life. The few years that we were able to spend together were absolutely the best of my life, and I owe that all to you. I greatly regret that I had to go so soon when I know that we would have continued to grow together and share our lives with each other every day, enjoying adventures like only the two of us can. I died doing something that I believe is very honorable, worthwhile, and necessary. I pray that in my life and death, I saved others' lives and kept a few from ever having to experience this war. I just regret that it had to come at the price of causing you any pain. The last thing I ever wanted to do was hurt you in any way. Live your life on earth to the max. You have so many options with what to do with your life. Pursue your dreams wisely with all your heart, with honor, and with decency. I will love you forever, look on you always, and see you soon. After Miles died, I went to this oof, grief group for a really long time. And um, in it... I remember the therapist, the counselor, he told us one night this thing that his grandmother used to say about how if you took everyone's sorrows and if you hung them from a tree like fruit and then you asked everybody to pick one, anyone they wanted, that we would still pick our own and so, I mean, that's how I think about it, right? I mean, I lost Miles, but he was amazing. And I'm so glad I got to know him. And I don't remember much of my dad. But I heard he was pretty great, too. And I think that Miles was a lot like him. Artis Henderson, author of Marry a Man Who Loves His Mother. Her memoir is Unremarried Widow. She lives in southwest Florida and writes full-time. We've posted Miles Henderson's full letter to Artis at wbur.org slash modernlove. More on this essay from Modern Love editor Daniel Jones after a short break. Support for Modern Love comes from Audible.com. Audible.com brings more than 180,000 titles to your ears. Audiobooks like Beautiful Ruins and Sweet Bitter are just a click away. 
Download the Audible app and listen on your commute, at the gym, or at the beach. There's something for everyone. Classics, nonfiction, romance, and much more. Right now, Audible.com is offering a free 30-day trial. Go to audible.com slash modern and get a free audiobook. It's that easy. Go to audible.com slash modern and get started today. Welcome back. Now a note from Modern Love editor for The New York Times, Daniel Jones. When you look at Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the U.S. has been at war for the entirety of the Modern Love column. Essays come in pretty regularly from spouses who are left behind and from people who have gone off to war and how that's, that strains their relationship and, and all the ways that we try these days to, um, to deal with that distance because we think we can through technology and Skype. And does that make it easier? You know, it, it seems like the answer to that is, is mixed. Um, and having that constant access, also for the soldier to have that constant access, can be as much of a strain as it is a joy because you're just, your worlds are so different and you're constantly ping-ponging back and forth between the two of them. Dan receives a lot of military-themed submissions, but he was blindsided by Artis Henderson's essay. When Dan read it for the first time, he thought it would be about a challenging relationship between a new wife and her mother-in-law. I talk a lot when I give advice to writers about not giving everything away at the beginning of a story and let people discover the story as it unfolds. And for some reason, in fiction, people think that's obvious. And in nonfiction, it's less obvious. They feel like, you know, you need to be up front and you need to tell people what they're about to read and what they're dealing with. But the same kinds of rules apply. You want a reader to be curious. You want them to be surprised. And how you order your story is important. It's, it almost seems strange to be talking about craft in an essay that's about such a devastating experience. But you're taking a reader on a journey. In this case, it's the same journey that you went through. Um, and artists went through this, and this was a shocking, devastating moment for her. And she takes the reader through that same surprise. And even the moment that it, that it happens and how she reveals it, she talks about how her mother-in-law reacted first. Um, it's very subtly unraveled. And it's just a wonderful meditation on sort of the expansiveness of love. Dan Jones, editor of Modern Love for The New York Times. Artist Henderson's essay was read by Constance Wu, who felt a very strong connection to the piece when she read it for the first time. I chose this particular story because I had actually just finished filming a project in which I played an army psychologist. I read so many stories of soldiers, and I talked to m at least eight different army psychologists, hearing about their experiences and the different kinds of people they talked to, and doing all that research and listening to all those stories made me really connect with this particular story. Thanks again to Constance Wu. You can see her in season three of the ABC comedy series Fresh Off the Boat. It premieres this week. There's more information on our website, wbur.org slash modernlove. Coming up next week, Rebecca Hall, star of the new drama Christine. She reads us a story about dating while manic. One morning, I met a man in the supermarket produce aisle. I hadn't slept for three days, but you wouldn't have known it to look at me. My eyes glowed green, my strawberry blonde hair put the strawberries to shame, and I literally sparkled. I'd worn a gold sequined shirt to the supermarket. Manic taste is always bad. I was hungry, but not for produce. I was hungry for him, in his well-worn jeans, Yankees cap slightly askew. Modern Love is a production of The New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It's produced, directed, and edited by Jessica Alpert, John Parati, and Emery Sievertson. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. Our casting consultant is Amy Lippins, CSA. Iris Adler is our executive producer. 
Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for The New York Times and advisor to the show. Music for the podcast, courtesy of APM. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. See you next week.